Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. So as he introduced me already, my name is Frank Mendez. Um, today, I wanted to mention um, that I'm, uh, w we launched version 2 and all this stuff. But uh, then I realized that not many of you really um, knew about what Async API is, right? So um, it doesn't make sense that I come here and say, hey, version 2, <laughs> yeah, of what, right? Um, so um, let me uh, start a little bit with the, with the story. So um, this is my young <laughs> me. Uh, <laughs> more, a bit more young. <laughs> so I used to work for uh, Neo Relic before I, I started working on, um, on Async API full time. And I, I would like to tell you um, a little bit the context of the, of the whole story that I'm gonna tell uh, afterwards. So I, I grew up in Badajoz. Badajoz is a, is a uh, for those of you, of you who don't know, it's a town uh, next to Portugal in South Spain. So um, at, the, at the age of 11, uh, I started coding. Um, and it all started because of a, of a dream or because of a lie, depends on how you look at it, right? So um, it was actually my brother who told me, mm, you know what, uh, Fran, if, if you learn coding, you will be able to, uh, to create your own games. Uh, yeah, tell, tell that to, an, <laughs> to a kid, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and I said, okay, so you know, hold my beer, <laughs> right? <laughs> or hold my juice because I was 11. Um, and so I started coding, right? Um, and it turns out it wasn't that easy, right? <laughs> um, so then I started doing more and more and more and realized, uh, okay, so a game is not just coding. It's also a bit of design, right? So what do you think I did? I studied design, <laughs> right? So I could design my own video games as well. And then I realized that once you grow up a little bit more, uh, you realize this is not just design and coding. This is also a little bit of storytelling and you know other things, right? And I didn't study storytelling. Uh, but um, I realized that it wasn't a single man job, right? It needs to be a team, uh, a team effort, right? And I was there, uh, and Ismail was there at the time. Uh, he can confirm. Uh, I, it, it was hard to find other people wanting to do stuff like coding or design or video game or whatever. It's really hard. So it was time to move to Barcelona, basically. So I moved to Barcelona and joined a company um, uh, called API Change Log and, or Hitch. You may have heard about them. And that then uh, we started exploring more about event-driven architectures. And so I, I got in love with this concept and forgot about uh, the games and <laughs> all this stuff, right? So um, for me, that was my game. Like, oh, this is my game. I'm, I want to um, study more about it. And I want to work in a good team with, uh, about it, about uh, event-driven architectures. And um, so we started digging more, right? Uh, with, no, with no luck. With no luck, like many startups, uh, uh, we ran out of money and we got acquired by New Relic. So suddenly I was working at New Relic. <laughs> um, so we, we got in charge of creating the, the internal integrations platform. So think about this like an integration platform, uh, like the public ones that you, you see very often, but only for internal customers, like internal teams. And in the beginning, it was more or less uh, like this, right? Like message broker there, uh, I put message broker because it could have been anything. In our case, it was Kafka. Um, and it was really simple. Like we had few services here and there, publishing and subscribing to Kafka. It's easy to, 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 to manage and, and to reason about, right? But then we started growing and suddenly you see the number of uh, interactions there. This is just uh, illustrative, it's not real life, but it was similar. 
So that came, uh, uh, that came after we had to grow our team. Um, because we grew, we grew our team, suddenly um, you, ha you had more speed, you had more services, and also uh, we had other teams in the company using our, uh, or testing our integrations platform. So you had more people publishing messages and subscribing to, to, to Kafka, right? And that's what happened afterwards. Like, and then someone comes to you and say, hey, Fran, uh, we're publishing here into this topic, into this Kafka topic, this message. Um, do you know who's using this information? Who's consuming this information? Uh, no, <laughs> right? Do you know it? Because I don't know it. Uh, I, I, ju I just offer you the w a way to do it, but I don't know who's, I know who's publishing, but I don't know who, who's consuming. And I have no way to track this. Right, and uh, you can imagine what it means. It means that uh, whenever you had to make a change into one of these services publishing or consuming from Kafka, um, that was terrifying. Like we're gonna break something for sure. Like for for sure, there's someone uh, expecting another message. So um, what happened? in the end is that we were creating new topics for each version of the message, which I think it's fine, but uh, it's, uh, it ends up having, you know, like, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the early days when you're iterating, you end up having like 10 topics for a single thing, for a single kind of message, because it has different, uh, the message has different structure. Um, and then this mess, keeps growing and growing and growing, and you have topics that nobody's using, but you don't know, so you don't remove them. Um, that's, uh, that's terrifying, like, uh, and, and we cannot look at the, at the Kafka, at the Kafka um, stats, because one could say, uh, if, if you have a connection open in this topic, then you know someone is using it, or not, because maybe it's just uh, subscribe, but it's doing nothing because of a feature flag here, here and there. So maybe it's just consuming it but doing nothing. So in, in, in practice, it's doing nothing. Um, these are old resources, but the, the problem is that uh, when, when people look at this type of diagrams, or, or whatever you want to call this, um, people see services, computers, sending information. Uh, I try to look at this as teams. This is actually team collaboration. These are people all spread all over the world trying to collaborate with each other because I'm publishing this message to Kafka, but I have many other teams consuming these messages from Kafka. And in theory, I should not know anything about these teams. In theory, that's, that's what the event-driven architecture, uh, architectures allows you, right? But that's a, uh, that's a half truth, right? Uh, that's a half truth. And these people are usually spread ar around the world, so time zones. Then you have the problem, you want to change something and you don't change it immediately and in half an hour you have it in production if you want or in an hour or whatever. You have to probably wait 24 hours, discuss whatever, and in the middle of the discussion you have to wait another uh, 24 hours because you probably have just one hour uh, uh, coincidence, uh, you know, you you you, you, co you, co um, you meet these people every day only for one hour or so, so you can discuss for one hour at most. Uh, so then it ends up being like at least 48, 48 hours to make a simple change. So how many how many of you are familiar with these event-driven architectures and uh, and all these? this kind of uh, stuff that I'm talking about. Okay, I see many raised hands. How many of you are actually implementing it in production? <laughs> Kafka, RabbitMQ, IBM MQ, whatever. Okay, lots as well. Cool, so you know what I'm talking about, probably. Um, let's play bingo. <laughs> I like to do this game here on stage, it's gonna be complicated this time because I'm in Spain, uh, but let's try. So 
bingo is a uh, I'm not, we're not going to play bingo, by the way. <laughs> Sorry for the, to disappoint. Uh, the bingo game is usually, for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, the concept of event-driven, I think this illustrates uh, the concept very well. So in the bingo, you have someone you know, uh, getting the balls and reading it on, uh, aloud. Uh, we can consider this person the publisher. So I get a, a ball and I read the number. I could be this person. And you could be, all of you could be there just uh, subscribe to my message, receiving my message, and processing it. Processing it is, if you have it on your, on your paper, you, you mark it, right? Uh, or just discard it because you don't have it. Um, but suddenly, at some point, some of you will become the publisher and will say, bingo. Uh, mm, I don't know how to say this in, in, in English. I think it's line, linear in English, <laughs> line. Um, but uh, at some point, you're going to say, bingo, right? And I will become the subscriber. because I, I will receive your message, right? And I will process it. So you get it, right? That simple example has an implicit contract that we oftentimes forget uh, uh, or ignore. Um, which is the language, right? Si eu falo português aqui agora, somos quantos vão para perceber, vão entender o que eu estou a dizer, right? So if I change the language, that's what I was saying. If I change the language, only some of you will understand, right? And some of you will break. You were expecting information in a format, and it was not delivered in that format. So bang, you lose money because it's a bingo. You're probably losing money, right? So that's what happen what's happening in companies as well, right? Uh, this is exactly um, the problem. We're not, uh, so what I was speaking about, about the language, it's part of the contract. It's an implicit part of the contract. And that's what we don't have in, in event-driven architectures, right? And that's why things are, are, are breaking so, so easily. So um, introducing async API, um, that's why we created async API uh, specification, right? So we are able to define this, this contract, this common language that we all speak, right? I'm always mentioning like event-driven uh, architectures because it's, it's like a, a common way to describe or a general, generic term for all these um, for all these architectures, right? But um, usually this is uh, seen in event-driven micro, can be micro or not, services, or uh, Internet of Things APIs, or you know, streaming APIs like the famous uh, Twitter API, streaming API that was closed last year, um, things like that, like anything that's uh, based on messages, like um, you, you subscribe, you publish, and then you subscribe to some messages, can be defined with this in KPI. I want to stress this out a lot. I get lots of questions very often, like, what protocol are you working with? None, or all of them. I mean, it depends on how you uh, look at it. So the, 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 the specification is to define the contract, the communication contract. We don't care if it's Kafka, if it's MQP, if it's MQTT. That's, I mean, th 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 we could even define the bingo example, <laughs> right? With this in KPI, so th that's uh, uh, just to put an example. We, of course, offer some tooling, uh, some implementations of the spec to use it with Kafka, to use it with uh, MQP or RapidMQ or IBM MQ, whatever, right? Or, or WebSockets. Uh, so you can generate uh, documentation, you can generate code, you can do all sorts of things, right? Just, uh, and, and, and all of that, just for what? It's exactly for, for uh, trying to prevent what I, uh, what I said before, uh, to prevent this problem that we don't know what our services are doing, right? So we have a formal documentation, and even we can use the, the async API file, the async API definition, to validate messages before they reach the broker, right? But I think this is a, 
another <laughs> separate topic. I, I'm happy to chat about it if anyone is uh, 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 willing to, to know more about API management for event-driven architectures. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, it's an interesting topic, but I think it's a huge different topic. Um, and uh, you're probably familiar with this, uh, with this list, like the API lifecycle. Uh, some people like to call it event lifecycle in, in, in the case of uh, async API. Again, I, will, uh, I want to stress uh, that also the, the factor that the fact that the uh, event driven architectures are also APIs. Uh, we tend to call APIs only to REST APIs or HTTP APIs, and that's not true. Uh, I mean, in, the, in, in our context, um, and that's not true because um, sometimes you have um, uh, not sometimes an API is actually something right that uh, that is actually listening for your for your requests or your uh, responses or uh, you know for messages actually something. It's it's a it's a system that allows you uh, to send information, will do and it will do something. It will uh, create a behavior on the other side on the application, right? You can do this with HTTP. You can do this with Kafka. You can do this with uh, TCP if you want, right? Um, so the life cycle of of an API, of a REST API, I would say, is exactly the same as in this case. Like we want to design the API the event-driven API. We want to document it. We want to probably generate code. We want to do some API management. We want to do some testing. We, do, we want to know what's happening with our system, right? Um, same thing. So with async, async API can play a role in all these areas. And um, as I said before, uh, now that you more or less know what async API, or I hope you know a little bit better what async API is about, at least the concept. Um, we, like two days ago, we released Async API 2.0. So the previous version, just for context, uh, only allowed kind of JSON schema-ish uh, uh, schema definitions, like in OpenAPI. It was exactly the same as in OpenAPI. Um, right now, we support JSON schema, OpenAPI schemas, and Avro. And some of you who are working with Avro will kill me if I don't mention this. We are in the process of supporting it in the tooling, but the spec, this is possible. <laughs> so we unified all the, the interfaces before for events, or uh, there was a separation between events and messages. Um, events was more, it was terribly, <laughs> a terrible name for, for that. But uh, events where, um, for instance, WebSockets, where you only have one channel and all the messages are in the same channel. And, and topics where, like in Kafka, where you have multiple channels and you can decide where the messages go through. And also we, we had a, um, a section in the spec called stream for HTTP streaming APIs, like server sent events and all this stuff. Right, so everything has been unified under channels. Okay, so everything is simplified now. And we also added a, a new concept um, called bindings or protocol bindings. Uh, and it's because we didn't want to pollute the, the specification with, um, with uh, protocol specific things. Like imagine Kafka, for instance, uh, is a it's a key value, uh, the messages are key value. They're, they're not just a, a JSON object or, or whatever. It has a key and it has a value. But that's only for Kafka. If we, do, if we put it on the spec, what do we do then with the other protocols? Uh, every, everything will be like kind of weird if, we, uh, if we're using WebSockets, right? So instead of polluting the spec with these kind of things, we added something called bindings that will allow you to put more information <laughs> of a specific protocol. For instance, we're using Kafka, I want this message to have the key X, but only when using Kafka. If you migrate your system to RabbitMQ tomorrow and, and, and you want to change it, you only have to change the Kafka part. The rest of the interface 
needs to, uh, has to be the same, right? Because the interface uh, haven't changed, just only your system back in it. Well, see, if, if you want to know more, um, you can go to asyncapi.com or uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions now or after, uh, I'll, I'll be around. And 25 minutes doesn't really, um, it doesn't, it's not really much time to show an example, but I'll be happy to, to show later. And um, thank you. Thank you, Fran, for the quick explanation on Async API. Any question from the crowd? No? So I had a question. Um, have you been helping any uh, company using uh, your specs uh, in practice with some? Uh, yes. So Slack, for instance, has uh, their public, uh, uh, their events API, Slack events API. Um, they have it publicly defined with Async API in their repo, so I help them. Uh, actually, most of it, uh, I wrote myself as an example to you how to use Async API, and then we continue. And uh, I'm also helping uh, Salesforce, uh, MuleSoft, and, and and other sponsors to uh, to create products on top of API, Async API to help other people um, create uh, Async API docu uh, documents. And do you have like a preferred way to present the specs in terms of uh, you know developer portal and developer experience? Or we have uh, a documentation generator and we have a playground as well um, that could be used uh, to generate HTML documentation or Markdown documentation. I prefer to have both, like uh, Markdown in the in the repo, for instance, along uh, along with the repo. Uh, with your code, and uh, a central place where you can have all the HTML doc documentation uh, browsable, right? So, um, so it's possible. Okay. Thank you again, Fran. Thank you. And we'll see you after lunch at 2 p.m.